Thank you, Stu, and welcome all of you. It, you know, it really is uh, terrific to see this auditorium full with, uh, with all, all of that uh, interest and expertise that you bring to this enterprise. It's, I think, one of the very special things about the Garvin Institute that really lives up to the vision of uh, the Sisters of Charity uh, many years ago, that it brings together the clinic, uh, the science, and the community, which is all of you. And uh, I don't know of any other institutes that that are achieved that in such a special way, and this morning is a perfect example of it. So let me start by giving you a little bit of an overview of, of why we're excited to be here today, and, as, and why, as Stu says, there really has never been a better time to be a medical researcher uh, and an immunologist. So there really is a global revolution happening in medicine. Uh, it's what we call uh, precision medicine. Uh, uh, we're moving from a phase where one size fits all. Now, so much of medicine, uh, the way it's practiced now, especially for immune diseases, very frustrating for the clinicians. Uh, we don't know the root cause quite often. Uh, that's what we're trying to crack. And so uh, every one of us that has an immune disease goes through a journey with our physicians. We'll try this, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. Then you try that, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and we don't have that uh, extraordinary ability that we now have, for example, with HIV disease, as one of our clinical colleagues says, when he sees a person with HIV, that used to be the problem then as well, but now he can do a test, say, oh, yeah, you've got HIV, and here's the three drugs you go on, and here's how it's going to play out over the next 30 years of your life. That's where we need to be with immune diseases and with all kinds of diseases that we work on here at the Garvin and right through the medical research community. The unique thing which we've never had before, is the most powerful blood test ever invented. Uh, and that's the ability to get the complete DNA genome sequence of each of us for an affordable price. So it's, it's the instruction kit of who we are. Now, why that's such a timely and historic movement that's happening is you can see in this graph, the first genome sequence costs the global enterprise $3.2 billion to get what was actually a collection of six people's uh, genomes mixed together. Right today, it costs us about $1,000 uh, here at the, at the Garvin Institute. Uh, and within a, a few years, it's very likely uh, that it'll cost in the order of a, a hundred or a couple hundred dollars. So put that in perspective, uh, it, right now, to get this complete uh, catalogue of, of all of the things that make each of us unique, uh, end to end, three billion letters of DNA, uh, it's about the same cost as getting a shoulder um, MRI test, uh, for example. And within a few years, it'll be about the same cost as getting uh, the Gardasil vaccine, for example. So it's, it's something that's happening now, and the big challenge that, that we're really at the front of at Garvin is how do we actually use this? How do we put this into practice to solve for example, the kinds of diseases that you're going to hear more about from the speakers this morning. What it allows us to do is to decipher all of those uh, unique differences, some that are unique to only our individual family trees, others that are wide, uh, to really create a, a revolution in healthcare. We're at the lead of this. Uh, so Garvin, uh, through the Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics, and really driven by philanthropic support to allow us to jump ahead uh, and do things when the conventional sources of support would say, well, we're not sure yet if it's ready, it's not yet feasible, you know, come back when it's half done. The beauty with philanthropic support is we've been able to set up the first outside the US and one of the first in the world clinically accredited facilities to be able to read someone's genome sequence uh, and provide the, uh, a, a complete readout of what do we know from that that might be useful immediately for someone's health and at the same time to store that so that you can come back to it next year, the year after, uh, and every time there's a, a progress uh, in knowledge, which is happening at a very rapid rate, uh, you get more information out of that test that's already been done. So here at Garvin, we, we're applying that particularly across six areas, which you can see here. Immunology, which is the thing we'll focus on this morning, cancer, uh, genomics, I've mentioned, underpins all of these. Neuroscience, uh, in particular, we're working, uh, moving into this space of how to apply genomics for all of the neurodegenerative conditions, Parkinson's, dementia, uh, 
hearing loss, uh, osteoporosis and bone diseases and cancers that home to bone, diabetes and metabolism and the diseases that, that come from all the metabolic challenges and wear and tear on our body. So some, some of the areas, and what makes us unique, is that we have all of these incredibly bright minds all under one roof, uh, exchanging information across these different disciplines, which as you'll see actually connect intimately with one another uh, because of the genome sequencing. Now we uh, don't work in a silo here at the Garvin Institute, we're incredibly collaborative. So we, we have 783 partners in research around the globe. Uh, uh, and I think some of the speakers will talk more about how important that is in the case of immune diseases uh, to leverage the world of knowledge and bring it to bear together with the unique knowledge that we have under the roof here. We work with a, a vast range of affiliates within Australia. Uh, so we work with all of the hospitals in Sydney, across New South Wales, around the country, uh, and all the other medical research institutes and universities. So we're very much believers that we can't do anything just in our own backyard, that we can combine our unique skills and expertise and domain knowledge with unique skills around the, the, the country and around the state, and it's together we'll be able to crack some of these big disease problems. So let me just give you one example to make all of that general picture real, uh, to start the ball rolling, uh, and this comes exactly from one of these uh, teams of people uh, that really could only uh, have happened as a result of this new change in genomics. Uh, so the team includes some of the best uh, paediatric uh, immunologists uh, in the country at the two Sydney Children's Hospital, and you can see their names there. The Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics uh, here at the Garvin Institute, where we have this clinically accredited blood test of being able to get the complete end-to-end -end DNA sequence of each person. Uh, a consortium of immunologists around the country that's been led by Stu Tangy here. Uh, my own team, uh, which was really em e enabled by uh, Julia and Ruth Ritchie and their family foundation, which allowed us to uh, jump uh, at the opportunities that the technology presented uh, and say, let's just go for it and see, what we can, see if we can solve some cases. Uh, and many of the other people here that, that you can see. So the, the one case that I wanted to share with you is a little boy called Alan. So he was one of the first uh, 54 uh, children at the two children's hospitals where, uh, as a group, we said, well, we've got the technology, and thanks to philanthropy, we have some support. Uh, if you have any cases that you just can't solve, uh, where the immune system's gone off the rails, let's sequence their genome and see whether we can make some progress. Uh, and Alan was one of those. So let me give you a bit of a sense of how the DNA sequence served a bit like those GPS coordinates that allow our phone to tell us you know, how to get from here to the CBD uh, using Google Maps and, and where to buy, you know, pick up some groceries along the way. A bit of a miracle, and it's the same kind of miracle. So the first piece to the puzzle uh, was, of course, uh, Alan's p uh, parents. Uh, and they made some observations when Alan was three that he was starting to develop terrible bruises uh, on his skin and internally, and in fact that became quite rapidly life-threatening. And he went to hospital, uh, ended up in intensive care, in and out for the next three years. The doctors uh, did some pathology tests, so that was the next piece to the puzzle. Uh, and that revealed that his immune system was, instead of attacking a virus, uh, was attacking his own blood cells, the red cells that carry oxygen and the platelets that are so crucial for clotting. And that's why he was de developing these terrible bruises, was that he, he was unable to clot his blood. Uh, and that was very dangerous. So he could not, couldn't go out. Suddenly his life was completely changed. He wants to be a little three or four year old boy. He can't do any kind of uh, rough and tumble play. A, a, a simple bruise could become life threatening. What's going on? Well, he's got the best doctors you could get, uh, and they make the diagnosis that he has an autoimmune disease. So Alan is one of 12% of people in Australia who have an autoimmune disease. There are over 100 autoimmune diseases, and typically anyone with any one of those goes on a journey of finding out eventually that they've got some disease that they've never heard of. Many of them are quite rare, and one of the problems is that 
it then means that uh, it's a very specialised area and for each person that goes on this journey, uh, they feel like, well, I've got this rare disease. But in reality, everyone with an autoimmune disease is part of a very large proportion of our population, one in eight, who have effectively the same problem. The immune system has gone off the rails and, like in Allen, is attacking one or other part of our normal body. Well, what can we do about it with genome sequencing? So we, none of the conventional medications were working uh, for Allen. So what we did was to sequence his genome, and that revealed that he had two defective copies of a gene called LRBA. Is that my phone? <laughs> I should have silenced mine, actually. Uh, two defective copies, a gene that only two years earlier we knew nothing about, uh, but uh, thanks to the global effort to share information by a variety of mechanisms, we knew that this was one of the new genes that causes both an immune deficiency, which we'll hear more about from Alyssa uh, and Stu, uh, and an autoimmune disease. But the beauty of this genome sequence result was it connected all of these other pieces of the puzzle to a whole world of basic science research that had been going on for 20 years in laboratories such as my own, uh, that had defined checkpoints that normally stop the immune system from attacking part of our own body. Uh, and in this case, uh, that science said that because he was missing this gene, Alan was missing this CTLA-4 checkpoint, which was very well studied. Uh, and even more importantly, uh, there was actually a version of CTLA-4, this checkpoint that he was missing, in a bottle. It was a drug that was approved, actually, for kids with a, a different kind of autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but you'd never would have thought to use it in Alan's case. Uh, but the science said this should basically replace what he's missing. Uh, but it was even better still because, the, again, the genomics connected with one other crucial piece to the puzzle, and that was a little boy eight years earlier in Cincinnati, of all places, who uh, a clinician like the clinicians that were looking after Alan, nothing else was working, it, really life-threatening autoimmune disease, had access to this CTLA-4 IG in a bottle, a Batacept, and tried it because it was approved and known to be relatively safe and found that this little boy eight years earlier made an exceptional response. It really halted the uh, attack on uh, his uh, different parts of his body. And then a year later, this uh, doctor in Cincinnati found another exceptional responder case like this. This is a drug that given to kids with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or adults only actually causes remission in 10% of people that get it. So it doesn't really work very well in, in the one-size-fits-all approach. But in a subset of people, uh, it works really well. And the genomics had caught up just a, a couple months before Alan's diagnosis to explain what these exceptional responder kids in Cincinnati. They, too, were missing the LRBA gene. And so that a piece of the puzzle was there, allowed us to give the whole package to Alan's physicians at the Children's Hospital at Ramwick, and they were able to then take it to the review board very urgently because Alan was in a very grave uh, state in the intensive care, uh, and get approval to try a Batacept. The science said it was right, the genomics said it was right. It's one of these wonderful cases where over the course of a weekend, all the pieces of the puzzle coalesced, not because of any one smart person, but because as a team, between the different places, we were all under one roof, and we were working on one set of coordinates, those genome sequence GPS coordinates. So here's Alan's uh, platelet count and red cell haemoglobin levels at the time of his genomic diagnosis. So you can see where normal is, and he's way below that, and that's why he's in intensive care. Here's, uh, two weeks later, a Batacep was started, and over the next four weeks, his platelets and red cells come back up into the normal range and he's out of ICU, running around the kids' ward with a lightsaber, and he's a Star Wars fan. And he is able to go home. The other brilliant thing is, because of this GPS coordinates, we were able to connect his physicians, in particular Bryn Weinstein, with physicians uh, that collaborate already extensively with Stu and Alyssa and others at the NIH and Bethesda and in Europe, who also treat kids uh, with this disorder. And they were able to provide advice about fine-tuning the dose and uh, timing to get the optimal exceptional response. And as a result of that, we're now two and a half years out, 
and Ellen has not had another recurrence of this most life-threatening problem of his immune system attacking his blood cells. It, the most telling thing of all is, is to visit his house and in the front yard there's a trampoline and he's bumping around out there with, you know, getting bruises all over the place with the neighbourhood kids. It's, it hasn't cured him but he is, uh, it has transformed his life uh, and it all comes uh, from research. So research really does work. What's going on here and getting to immunology is is, is this, Alan is one example of these competing pressures on our immune system. On the one hand, the immune system has this arsenal of weapons to fight microbes, and Stu will tell us more about those in a moment, but it also has to tolerate the microbes and tolerate all our normal parts of our body. Remember, there are as many microbes inside our intestines, uh, mostly good microbes, as there are cells that make up our body, uh, and there's as much microbial DNA, DNA in our body as there is our DNA. And, and it's a, important that we don't use all of those immunological weapons to fight those microbes. And, and so that's where these checkpoints come in. And in Alan's case, he's, he's missing one break on his immune system, this CTLA-4 break. And that then leads to autoimmune disease and inflammatory bowel disease, which he also has struggled uh, with but is now pretty much under control. Uh, but it also has uh, swings and roundabouts. So that same checkpoint was the first uh, great success in a 100-year journey of harnessing the immune system to seek out cancer cells where they, wherever they are in the body, starting with malignant melanoma, uh, and get the immune cells to track down the cancer cells and knock them off in a way that uh, even the chemotherapy was unable to do. Uh, and that involved essentially an antibody that blocks this CTLA-4 checkpoint to release the break on the immune system so that it can actually attack the cancer cells. Uh, and that's now become a very important third pillar for medical treatment of cancer here at the Garvin and around the world. So uh, really, what are we about? Our vision at, at Garvin is, is a longer life and a longer, healthier life, that without medical research, we, you know, we'll live, you know, if we're lucky, 65, 75, but at a certain point we start hitting those bumps in the road. In Alan's case, he hit them a lot earlier. Uh, but with research, we'll get people like Alan and people like me and people like each of you, uh, ideally, uh, with, uh, to a point where we'll all live to 80 or 90 uh, and we'll live with cancer. Uh, we won't die of cancer. We'll live with uh, autoimmune diseases, but they won't extract uh, a problem in our lives. Uh, we'll, we'll have a rational basis for solving the, any problems as they come up and we'll nip things in the bud before they become intractable. So it all begins with each of you and with the community. This place was started on the basis of the community getting together with uh, the Sisters of Charity and with the hospital and the research community to say, look, we're not going to wait till government does it. We want it to start right now. And every project that, that's world beating in this place usually starts with a donation uh, that allows one of our gifted people under one roof to, to take an idea and put it into practice and then get it to the point that it's ready to go to the National Health and Medical Research Council or uh, the US NIH or one of the bodies in Europe for peer-reviewed funding. Because by that stage they've got runs on the board, they show it shown that they've turned their idea into something that has uh, some feasibility and traction. It's worked in X number of people. Now they ask for the money to, to do it in 10X. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, look forward to hearing the rest of our speakers. It's uh, terrific to have you all here today.